Hello, and welcome again to my uh, YouTube channel. I'm Reverend Mike Ritten with the Bowman Charge of the United Methodist Church located in Bowman, South Carolina. And I thank you for tuning in. I hope you've been following my presentation on the book of Revelation. And this week, we're going to continue. Uh, it's going to be a shorter sermon. There are only eight verses in this uh, particular chapter, chapter 15. So uh, it'll be interesting. There's still some things that um, some of you folks might not understand or, or need a little bit of clarification. So that's why I'm still taking them one chapter at a time. So let's open with a word of prayer. Almighty God, in wisdom you have created us and all things. Provide our daily needs and grant us grace and strength to fulfill the ministry to which we have been called. We offer our prayers in the name and spirit of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And yes, each of us has been called to a particular ministry. Your ministry may be as a banker, a housewife, a teacher. Whatever your ministry is, that's what we just prayed about. Anyway, <coughs> excuse me. Our scripture reading for today comes from the book of Revelation, chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. Hear now the inspired and errant word of God. Again, John is still writing in this scroll, and he writes <coughs> the following, excuse me. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous seven angels having the seven last plagues for in them the wrath of God is complete and I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire and those who had the victory over the beast over his image and over his mark and though and over the numbering of his name standing on the sea of glass having harps of gold, of God, I'm sorry, harps of God. They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, for all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifested. After these things I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And out of the temple came the seven angels having the seven plagues clothed in pure bright linen, and having their chests girded with golden bands. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. The temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Again, that was chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. And I titled this sermon, The Preparation of the Bowls. Lord, may the words of my mouth be pleasing to you today and be of inspiration to those who have gathered here for the reading and hearing of your most holy word. I ask these things and pray this prayer in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Since the seventh trumpet doesn't have a plague of its own, even though it's the third woe, we must conclude that the seven bowls make up the third woe. These plagues will only be poured out on those who have bore the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. Just like the seven trumpets, 
the purpose of the seven bowls is to give the people a chance to repent of their wicked, evil ways and worship God and Christ. With the visitation of the plagues from the seven bowls, God will pour out his wrath and we would expect the final judgment to occur. We shouldn't take verse 1 literally to mean that God is, God's final judgment has arrived. The beast, the false prophet, and those who worship the image of the beast have not yet been thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone. The outpouring of God's wrath in the line of the great, let me, the outpouring of God's wrath in the time of the great tribulation is an attempt to make the worshipers of the beast repent of their evil, wicked ways and turn to worshiping God. In verse 2, John is given a vision of the saints whom the beast has martyred. As noted in last week's sermon, these are the folks who have remained loyal to God through their persecution, have remained loyal to the teachings of God, and have remained faithful to Jesus Christ. They have conquered the beast because they refuse to deny God and his teachings even in the face of death. There's no reason to interpret the sea of glass as anything other than that which stands before the throne of God. The fire doesn't really have any bearing. It's, it's still the sea of glass that's in front of God's throne. The beast, though the beast thought that he had won the victory by slaying these people. However, they have won the victory because in death, they've been moved from earth directly into the presence of God. The harps of God in their hands further illustrates their victory. Harps are an expression of praise and worship for God throughout the Old Testament. Here, the victors express their joy in the form of songs of praise. Scholars continue to de debate whether verses 3 and 4 are one song or two. On the surface, it appears that this might be one song with two verses. The Song of Moses is perhaps a song of the praise concerning the exodus and deliverance from Egypt. The Song of the Lamb is a song of deliverance from the hatred and persecution by the beast. Just as God delivered Israel from Egypt while pouring out plagues on the Egyptians, God has delivered the saints from worshiping the beast while pouring out his judgment on the worshipers of the beast. The song is not one of spiritual redemption, but is a song of proclaiming the mighty works of God. Taken out of context, the words in verse 4 seem to indicate a universal salvation for all the people of the earth. However, such an assumption is biblically incorrect. Scripture clearly teaches that there will come a time when God will be surrounded only, only by those who truly worship him and are true followers of Jesus Christ. Verses 5 and 6, or in verses 5 and 6, we learn that the final seven plagues are about to begin with the emptying of the seven bowls, carried by seven angels, who come out from the very presence of God. In these two verses, we have the reference to the tabernacle, which was the dwelling place of God in the wilderness whenever the Israelites stopped for any extended period of time, and the temple of God, which was built by King Solomon in the city of Jerusalem. The tabernacle performed the 
the tabernacle provided, sorry about that, the blueprint for the temple, which in turn provided the blueprint for God's dwelling place in heaven. Normally, John doesn't describe any of the angels in his visions in any detail. However, in verse 6, he does describe their clothing to indicate their importance. The, the fact that, they, that their chests were girded with gold bands does not suggest that they perform any kind of priestly function. Then one of the four living creatures gives each angel a golden bowl. These bowls are like a shallow vessel used for drinking water or other forms of drink. Since the four living creatures stand close to the throne of God, we can assume that the bowls have divine sanctification. The words, who lives forever and ever, is another reminder that Although evil may seem to dominate the affairs of human history, God's purposes cannot be overturned by satanic or demonic evil. In the Old Testament, when God revealed himself to the people, he often appeared in the form of smoke to indicate his glory. The smoke would prevent the people from being able to see him. Throughout the, the Old Testament, it was told that if you saw the face of God, you would die immediately. So God would, again, be in his presence, and there would be smoke around him so that we wouldn't see his face and drop dead. We should not interpret verse 8 to mean that God is unapproachable, but we should focus on his majesty and glory. Next week... We will read about John's vision of the pouring out of the individual bowls. Told you it was going to be a short one. Anyway, thank you for joining me. Let us close in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. And Lord, we ask that you continue to open our ears, our hearts, and our minds to the teaching that you will have us receive. Thank you again, Lord, for the many blessings that you have bestowed upon each and every one of us. We ask that you continue to watch over us, guide us, and bless us. And in these troubling times, Lord, we ask for your divine protection. Again, all honor and glory belong to you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, again, thank you for tuning in to uh, my channel. I hope you've enjoyed this study. I've had a couple folks in my churches have said that they really enjoy it because nobody's kind of broke down a, a book of Revelation for them and kind of explained it. So at least a couple people enjoy it. <laughs> I'm enjoying it. Uh, these are the times that we, we really need to, to understand what lies ahead. We don't know when the final end of everything will come about. God's the only one who knows that. So, hey, we need to be prepared. So, having said all that, again, I thank you for tuning in, and we're going to close with the benediction. Today, walk in the power and presence of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Take care. God bless, and I hope to, you will all tune in again next week as we continue the study of the book of Revelation. Take care and God bless.